Finally, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio is presented by DSI Sportsbook. If you sign up over at DSI using the promo code BTB and the number 25, you'll get that $25 free bet just for signing up. Take a look around. Check out the mobile interface. Check out the desktop site. Check out customer service if you want. Look at the house rules, all that type of thing. If you decide to deposit over there, a 100% deposit match book match bonus excuse me, for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino as well. At BetDSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two guests coming your way here today. The first, Mr. Brad Powers from BradPowersSports.com. Bradley, how's it going today, brother? It's going well. How are you doing on this fine Thursday morning? I'm doing real well, man. Lots of stuff going on here. we got four games coming up tonight, three games coming up tomorrow night. We're going to go ahead and dive right into some game analysis here. Beginning with Friday night, we talked earlier on in the week about the Florida State-Boston College game, so we'll touch on the two other games coming up here on Friday, both in the American Athletic Conference, one of my favorite conferences. We'll start with game 113-114 here on the board. Tulane takes on Memphis. Memphis 10.5 or 11-point favorite. Looking back at last week's, a lot of people expected Tulane to have a little bit of trouble with South Florida. They sneak in the back door, get that cover. Will they be as fortunate with a similar line this week, Brad? Well, they haven't been as fortunate if you first start off your handicap with a series history. Memphis has beat them 10 straight times going 8-2 and two against the spread in those 10 games. Uh, while you mentioned Tulane snuck in the back door, uh, it wasn't a great look for them for the first, you know, 50 minutes of that game. I mean, they were trailing South Florida 34-7 to in that one. And, uh, you know, defensively allowed, you know, 378 yards rushing offense, including, you know, more than seven yards per carry in that one. So that one was a little bit, uh, as far as the final score, looked a little bit better than what the box score was, at least early on in the game with them getting several late touchdowns. And keep in mind, also, South Florida missed a couple of chip shot field goals. So, I thought that was a relatively fortunate cover for Tulane. On the flip side, I thought Memphis was fortunate getting a win on the road in Houston. That was a game that they trailed by 17 at halftime, still trailed by 17 at parts in the second half. Uh, you know, if you would have given me a box score stat line of them getting outrushed by more than 200 yards in that game, I would have said the chances of them winning were probably 10%. But, uh, you know, Riley Ferguson throws for well over 400 yards, and uh, they get to come from behind win in, in that one, uh, and a lot of it had to do, you know, they had a, a special teams long touchdown to answer a score from Houston. Both teams that, that looking after last week's game, i got to be honest with you, I was looking to play against the fact that they're playing one another. Don't see a tremendous amount of value here, Adam, but, uh, you know, for me, I'd probably have a slight lean towards uh, the Memphis side of things. Yeah, I've got this number 10.5 in my power rating, so I'm pretty much right there on the number, at least at Bet Online, Bookmaker, DSI couple of shops out there sitting 11 right now, including Bovada. So it looks like a little bit more of the public investment here on Memphis, and that's not really a big surprise. But there is one thing I want to point out to our listeners here. When you look at pass defense in the country, Tulane has faced the second fewest passing attempts. They've only faced 149 here through seven games. They've played a couple of option teams. They've played some other run-heavy teams. So, Brad, when we talk about, you know, we, we talked about it last week with Penn State taking on Michigan and how you know, Penn State was finally getting tested, and, and they certainly passed that with flying colors. What about this spot for Tulane here with this pass defense actually going to get a workout for the first time in a while? Yeah, and that would be something. And they don't get to see, it, even in practice, a particularly good pass offense because Tulane themselves runs a version of the, the option. And for, for themselves, they've only attempted about 110 passes for the year. So and when you're not used to facing it, uh, it's going to be a struggle, and really about the only team that's a real great passing offense they've faced so far, Oklahoma, and obviously the, the Sooners, you know, shredded them for well over 400 yards. And you know, and South Florida's not too bad with Quentin Flowers, but the, the reality is they didn't have to be very good in the pass offense when, when you're running. And even FIU, I would say, uh, you know, ran right down their throat. So I mean, that would be a little bit concerning there. And then the fact that they haven't seen a passing offense. Yeah, I, th that's another reason why I'm leaning towards the Memphis being the play here. I, I don't know how Tulane stops them. Uh, I, I really don't. I R Riley Ferguson, one of the better group of five quarterbacks, got a couple of stud wide receivers, and uh, yeah, look, Tulane was a team I wanted to to play on right after that Tulsa game, and then the FIU, and it was a team that I thought was capable of making a bowl run here, and then it, that FIU game happened, and. and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what to make of Tulane moving forward. Right now, I'd wanna, I'm in the sell position. 
All right, let's slide down one spot here on the board game, 115-116. Tulsa takes on SMU. SMU, eight and a half, nine point favorite here, but this number was double digits early in the week. It was 10. I'm surprised to see this number moving down. I mean, Tulsa's body of work is, is just not exciting at all. I am. Uh, my number is 10 and a half uh, on the game, and I downgraded SMU from last week. Uh, they had a fight on their hands in overtime, uh, winning at Cincinnati. But I, I think they're motivated. They're one win away from bowl eligibility, and when you look at uh, some of the back half of, uh, of their schedule, uh, this, this has got to go into the win column here because coming up on, on deck are, are games against Central Florida, Navy at Memphis, and, and there may be another winnable game at Tulane. And this is a, a must win for them sitting here at 5-2 and two if they, they want to make sure they get to a bowl game this year, which would be a good look for Chad Morris. Uh, on the flip side, Tulsa, uh, I thought the final score last week looked better uh, th- than what it really was. They're getting shut out 20 to nothing. Their last three drives are all 70 yards or more. That represented well over half of their total yards in the game, so they got about all of it in garbage time when Connecticut was in prevent up 20. Uh, body of work at Tulsa is not good, and I, I think they're getting overvalued for that 45-17 to 17 game against Houston two weeks ago which was a completely misleading final because five minutes left in the third quarter, it's 10-10, and also Tulsa scored two touchdowns in the final 40 seconds. I'm playing against that. I think SMU is very motivated, surprised at the line move here. I'll take it under consideration that the market's against me, but I'm also not going to be afraid of what I've seen over a seven, eight-game body of work here. Uh, you know, SMU doesn't have a great rushing uh, you know, defense, but uh, also you look at the running back for Tulsa is a little bit banged up. SMU might actually make it as a premium pick on my board if the line continues to drop. Now, one of the things we can consider here, and and perhaps this is the reason why this number is moving, you mentioned Tulsa, that big win over Houston, albeit misleading. It's still a 45-17 to win, and and that's what people are going to see about that game. Meanwhile, SMU lost to Houston 35-22. to A lot of people watched that Memphis-Houston game last week, saw Houston totally collapse. So, is this one of those spots where you get some common opponent bias? And, and we see these, you know, during conference play from time to time. Yeah, and I think you definitely do. But I, you got to be careful just reading into box scores. SMU, yeah, lost 35-22 in that game. But that was a game that they probably should have covered. They had multiple trips uh, deep in Houston territory and should have gotten the cover in that one. Uh, and maybe they're seeing, you know, may, maybe they're perceiving, and this would be a little bit more of a, a sharper public uh, better. Maybe they're seeing, you know, after SMU covered their first five games of the season, they're thinking that they're paying a point spread premium, and SMU has not covered the, their last two games. But I got to be honest with you. And, and the other stunning thing to me, Adam, is the market was totally against Tulsa last week. That was a line that moved three, four points against Tulsa in the Connecticut game and proved to be correct. And for the fact that the market to do a complete flip on that one has me, you know, it's bewildered me a little bit, but I got to go off my pure power rating. I got to trust it. And I also trust the spot here for SMU and and who should be motivated. Uh, I'll take the ponies in this one minus the points. All right, let's move on over to Saturday here. We'll go to the SEC game, 121-122 on the board. Vanderbilt takes on South Carolina. Both of these teams off of a bye. I was at this game last year in Nashville. South Carolina uh, won on a 50, I think it was a 52-yard field goal from Elliott Fry. It was a game that set offense back several decades. It was brutal to watch, but it was the season opener for both teams. Like It was one of those uh, Thursday night, August 31st games or something like that. Uh, but now you run into a situation with both these teams off of a bye. Vanderbilt has allowed 59, 38, 45, and 57 points in their last four games. The body of work for South Carolina, not very impressive. They are 5-2, and two, but it's a pretty misleading 5-2 and two when you go game by game from a box score standpoint. So Gamecocks are laying seven here at williams Price. I actually bet South Carolina here. Uh, I just I trust their. You said not a very impressive body of work, but give them credit. They find a way somehow, some way to to get wins, uh, whether it be you know getting outgained in the opener by 250 yards, but somehow they beat a pretty good NC State team. Uh, they get outgained by Missouri, but win the game by 18. You got to give them credit there. You know, they did not have a good performance against Kentucky. Did not have a good performance. Louisiana Tech was misleading where they rallied back. 
the A&M game, they're banged up on the offensive line. They continue to be banged up on the offensive line. Their plus four turnover score a bunch of defensive touchdowns and a blowout win over Arkansas, but they did find a way to blow out Arkansas, and then they rally and beat Tennessee on the road prior to the bye. Uh, look, uh, I don't know what it is. It doesn't translate to the box score, but even last year's team I thought was a little phony for South Carolina, but they found a way to get the bowl eligibility, got the extra practices. They're finding ways to win, uh, cover, blow out teams that the box score says they shouldn't but they continue to do it here on the flip side Vanderbilt you look at them great 3 and 0 start for them highlighted by the Kansas State game i mean the last four games have been a dumpster fire they've been outscored 50 to 18 on average total collapse on the defensive side of the ball allowing more than 200 rushing yards in each of their last five games i i trust south carolina's defense more i trust the spot for south carolina because the fact that a win gets them back to bowl eligibility and I also trust them in the series. They've beaten Vanderbilt eight straight times. Uh, I, I'm going with the Gamecocks. Now, I did not bet it at seven. I did bet it at six and a half. So I want to put that out there. I Obviously, that's a very key number. And, and while I still like South Carolina, I love them at the six and a half number that I bet earlier in the week. So looking out there in the market right now, seven minus 05 at DSI and bookmakers, seven minus 02 at Bet Online. Is that still worth a look for you, even though it's not the six and a half? Yeah, I definitely still lean that way. Uh, I mean, w- w- Vanderbilt hasn't competed at all. I, I mean, look, even Old Miss. I mean, w- what's o- Old Miss is not a good team at, uh, since their first two games of the season. I, I mean, uh, Mississippi has been pretty much blown out by every team they faced except against Vanderbilt, where, where they managed six, over 600 yards. So I, I don't know if a, a bye week's gonna, you know, fix a, a, what was a, a pretty broken Vanderbilt defense. I know they looked good the first three games of the season, but man. Uh, I have not seen any semblance of a defense the last four weeks. I mean, that's even against a a relatively mediocre Florida offense where they're giving up more than 450 yards. So uh, I think South Carolina is going to have success moving the football. And and then you look at Vanderbilt's offense has been hit and miss. I mean, less than 200 yards against Georgia, less than 100 yards against Alabama. Uh, They've been, they've only got two games where they, they, they managed more than 400 yards of offense. So, uh, I thought the program was going the, uh, the, the best direction there uh, under Derek Mason. He, he's got to find a way to get some wins here. Now, they do have, I think, three very winnable games coming up on deck, Western Kentucky, Kentucky, and Missouri all at home. Now, those are going to be pretty big for him. Uh, I'm not saying that he's on the hot seat whatsoever, but I'm saying he can ill afford to you know, finish the season 4-8, and eight, especially after you're starting 3-0. and oh. That would send the program back a year or two as far as recruiting goes. Had a listener question about this game, so let's go ahead and talk about this one between Marshall and Florida International. FIU, now a 17-point dog out there in the market, 16-and-a-half, has come back after going away early on in the week here. And Marshall's one of those teams that's starting to get some buzz, and, and you like to look for sell points. And generally speaking, that's the kind of thing you look for. When a team starts to get some attention, you look to go against them. There was a big article over at the All-American, which is the Athletics uh, College Football National site, and FIU playing much, much better than expected under Butch Davis. I had no expectations for this FIU team at all coming into the year, but they've looked much better than I anticipated. So is this number too big, or is you know Marshall just that good of a team? Uh, I don't have a strong take here. I, I mean, the, the old forced lean would be on FIU just because you know my number still has Marshall probably right around 15, 15 and a half in this game. Um, and, and I'd be more inclined to take the 17, although, you know, Marshall's far exceeded my expectations, and I think everyone's expectations uh, besides maybe my former boss. I, I'll, I'll tip the cap to him. He was uh, wearing uh, the green and the white uh, <laughs> well before anybody out there in the marketplace. You know, they had a misleading win over Miami and Ohio in the opener, but really since then, uh, I mean, they've looked the part, including a cover on the road against NC State, a game that they only got out gained by 34 yards. The team that's 6-1 and one straight up, 6-1 and one against the number. You know, defensively, I mean, they're as good as it gets in the group of five. But they're only allowing 14 points per game. And you take out the NC State game, I mean, uh, not a lot of teams have been able to move the football, including pretty much anyone they've played so far in Conference USA. You're right, FIU has exceeded expectations, although – 
you know, I'm going back through my notes. I, I did. I mean, coming in the season, they were a top 10 team as far as experience wise uh, coming into the country. So I, I probably had a little bit higher expectations than most. But, you know, give them credit. I thought the Tulane game two weeks ago prior to their bye was a very, very good performance. Obviously, they're a double-digit home underdog. That they win the game. They they show, you know, at least – they give up 200 yards against the option, but that's not bad at all, especially when Tulane had no passing threat whatsoever. So only allowing 239 yards in that one and 10 points. That was a very good look for Butch Davis, who has not been in the head coaching ranks and I thought would maybe struggle defending the option in that game. They've exceeded expectations. Both teams, I mean, obviously Marshall already got bowl eligibility. They're looking for a conference championship. FIU's looking for bowl eligibility. If they get that, Butch Davis should be up for Coach of the Year honors, I think. Um, 17 out there, I, I'll be on the take. What the heck? We're on the radio here. Uh, we need to get a, a show for uh, pick for the podcast. Uh, I'll take FIU plus the 17. I don't know what exactly to do with this game, but I can tell you that I'm almost going to blindly fade Marshall next week against Florida Atlantic because this is a Marshall team per Sagarin that has played the 126th ranked schedule in the country. They have played nobody really over the last five weeks. Cincinnati is kind of a disaster. We touched on them a little bit last week. Kent State is bad. Charlotte's one of the worst teams in FBS. Old Dominion's getting better as they get healthier, but when Marshall caught them, they were, they were dealing with some significant injuries. And last week against Middle Tennessee State, well, Middle Tennessee State has some players, but Richie James has been out. Brent stockstill has been out. That's a very watered-down Blue Raiders team at this point. So when Marshall steps up in class next week and plays Florida Atlantic on a short week, I'm going to be on the Owls here in that spot. Uh, but as far as this week goes, I mean, maybe this is a little bit of a look-ahead spot for them too because I know, I know that they're 6-1. and one. They've already secured bowl eligibility. They're playing now for a spot in the Conference USA uh, championship game and that game next week against Florida Atlantic going to be a big one in that equation but also like this team's got to be dying and chomping at the bit to play somebody and I don't know if FIU is that somebody this week yeah that's a good call there although you know I, I don't know what the line's going to be next week because I gotta be honest with you uh, the marketplace looks like they upgraded Florida Atlantic significantly like a touchdown uh, after last week's results uh, against uh, North Texas. So I'm anxious to see what that number is going to be next week, particularly if Florida Atlantic goes in and dominates Western Kentucky like the market at least thinks. I'm not saying dominate, but, I mean, when you're a touchdown favorite on the road uh, against the two-time defending champs, uh, you're very well thought of. Uh, we'll see what that line is. I-, I agree with you. I would prefer the spot for Florida Atlantic there. But I'm just, you know, my number says that the Florida Atlantic right now would probably be favored by about three or four. I'm just wondering what the market's going to have because my, my market number on Florida Atlantic right now is about almost a touchdown less than the current marketplace. Yeah, that's an interesting point to make. And, and Florida Atlantic's been a really weird team to try and figure out because last week all that North Texas money came in and they hung, what, 69 on North Texas? or I mean, they just destroyed them in that game. It was an awful, awful spot for North Texas, and I couldn't understand the line move at all in that game. But, yeah, Florida Atlantic seems like – you know, all year long, though, they've been a team that I, I just – I haven't had a good pulse on how they've been rated. You know, I've been following them very closely. Obviously, with Kendall Bryles and Lane Kiffin, you're going to follow a team very closely. But, yeah, my, my lines have been off on them almost every single week here, and it just feels like there have been some massive swings all year long with the Owls. Yeah, I mean, I liked them early, the whole market. I mean, they, they were my number one season win total best bet. I mean, it was four. Uh, that was the biggest bet I had in the off season was on them over. So I'm pretty happy with that so far. But, you know, the market moved 10 points. I mean, the early number against Navy, and I bet on them, Navy plus 21. They can't cover that one, even though the market went all the way down to like nine and a half on that one. I thought they had a decent performance against Wisconsin, blew out Bethune-Cookman. And then a game where I I thought, you know, hey, they're going up to Buffalo. Not a great spot, but I thought they were clearly better. They don't get the job done there. So I'm kind of in sell mode because they've cost me a couple of tickets. And then they put the – give them credit. I mean, they put together three straight wins and covers all in pretty much dominating fashion once they hit Conference USA. So uh, definitely it looks like the buy sign is on. But I still got a couple of losing tickets in my pocket already backing them. So I guess I'm a little bit more cautious than the rest of the world is at this point. Well, and obviously here, if we are looking to play Florida Atlantic next week, you hope for a Marshall win and cover that takes them to 7-1 and straight up and against the spread. 
so they can keep getting that respect out there. And maybe we can get a little bit better of a number on Florida Atlantic in that one. All right, Brad, it's a thirsty Thursday. So let's have a couple of cocktails here on the show. Georgia and Florida, neutral site game, world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Georgia is a 13 and a half point favorite here on a neutral field in Jacksonville. Uh, I mean, hey, they deserve to be though, right? Uh, yeah, pure power ratings. Yes, they, they do actually. Uh, you know, pure power rating for me says, says they should be about a 15 point favorite. So, yeah, I mean, uh, let's, uh, you know, let's back Georgia here. Well, and here's the problem. I mean, this is a pretty big rivalry. And the fact that you look at series history, and look, series history matters in these. For people that say, nah, those games back played, you know, 10 years ago don't matter. Yeah, the current players aren't there. But and there, sometimes there's a certain mystique here. And the reality is it doesn't matter who's been coaching, um, you know, either team here since 1990, Florida's dominated the series. I mean, they're 21-6 and six straight up, 17-8-2 and two against the number. And then you start looking for outliers. And this is just a personal handicap for me because when you look for outliers in the marketplace, a lot of times, more often than not, it means it's an overreaction. And Georgia has not been favored by this much over Florida in 40-plus seasons. My records only go back to 76, so maybe it's one of their biggest favorite roles over Florida ever since they've been playing one another. Uh, I would like to play against that. And then you also look the fact, you just look at the scores and how they performed against Florida throughout the years. They lost three straight by double digits, uh, even though they were expected to, you know, to be competitive, if not win those games the last three years. And they haven't beaten the Gators by more than 14, in 20, by, by more than 14 points since 1997. So I, got, I still have, with all that's going around with Florida and their offense still sucks, I still have a really good Florida defense that has kept them in pretty much every single game this year. I'm going to take the Gators plus the points here in a proud, disrespected underdog uh, against Georgia. Georgia's going to win. They'll break their losing streak against Florida. But uh, I, I think 13 and a half is a little bit much. Wish I'd have been out there in the marketplace. Uh, there were some bigger numbers earlier in the week, and, and I didn't take advantage of them. I should have. This is a game here. If you look at the Golden Nugget game of the year lines that came out, what, back in June, I believe it is. Florida was a one-point favorite in this game. So we've seen easily a two-touchdown swing here between these two teams from a power rating standpoint. And those are always significant to look at as well. I mean, now we've got, you know, six games of data for Florida, seven games of data for Georgia. So, you know, obviously we have enough of a sample size to make adjustments of this caliber. Uh, but still, it's a pretty significant departure from what we saw over the summer. Yeah, but I'll be honest with you, you know, going over my power ratings, I got George up probably about a touchdown from where I had at the start of the season, and Florida with all their suspensions with, with their injuries piling up, uh, I got them about a touchdown worse than what I had at the start of the season. So I actually make it makes sense. But, man, that the, even though you're going game by game and going through their schedules, and it makes sense to, to power rate these teams two touchdowns different, uh, it, that's still pretty steep. Uh, when, when you got both factors going, uh, against one another as far as Georgia being so up, Florida being so down. I guess it looks a little bit, you know, <laughs> like an overreaction. But I- I'm telling you, even though I, I like Florida in this matchup, it- it, to me it's more pure history and playing on the Florida defense to keep it close because my power ratings number says, says the market's correct, and-, and the market's probably even a little short at the current 13 and a half. All right, Brad, I want to go off script here a little bit. I know I sent you a list of games, but I want to touch on these two here, and, and we'll do that instead of the pick six for this week. You're a Notre Dame fan. You have been dating back to childhood, so I definitely want to get your thoughts here on game 179-180 between North Carolina State and Notre Dame. This number's painted seven pretty much across the offshore market, except for at some of the more public slanted shops. Bovada showing seven and a half, five times at seven and a half, but the dog minus 130, so that's effectively seven as well a little bit of teaser protection and stuff like that going on in that line. Uh, but, I mean, is, this number's moving down. Is, is this the way it should be going? Yeah, I think so. It's the antithesis uh, of last week's game. And this breakdown why Notre Dame clearly was the right side last week. Uh, just uh, from a pure uh, – you just looked at the situation, Notre Dame off a of bye, USC playing eight straight weeks. Uh, Notre Dame matchup-wise matched up very well against USC, particularly at the line of scrimmage. Their rush offense against the banged-up defensive line for USC. So matchup situationally all favored Notre Dame in that one. And people are still, there's questions to be had, uh, you know, how good Notre Dame really was prior to that one. Well, questions answered. And then some that they beat USC 
uh, by the biggest margin of victory for Notre Dame in that series since 1966. So, you know, I've been following Notre Dame for the last 20, you know, actually, man, i got to start aging myself now, probably the last quarter century <laughs> very well. Uh, and, and i I got to tell you, and, and this is since the Holtz days here, and now that's entering, unfortunately, two-plus decades. Whenever the media starts propping Notre Dame up, as a so-called contender, whether it be, you know, a BCS bowl contender or a playoff contender or just a legitimate top 10 team, you got to start running in the other direction. That's what's told me the last 20 years. And then you start diving in the handicap. Situation favors NC State. They're the ones coming off a of buy in this one. Notre Dame, meanwhile, off that big blowout win over their arch rival. And then you look at matchup-wise. Well, guess what? NC State's strength on defense is their defensive line. Bradley Chubb, in my opinion, might be the best defensive lineman in all of college football. They are number six in the country in rush defense. you got to be good to slow down that Notre Dame rushing offense. And the only team that they've faced so far that's been really good at rush defense has been Georgia. And what happened in that game? Georgia shut down Notre Dame's rushing offense, limiting them to 55 yards. Another thing Notre Dame's done exceptionally well this year, scoring off of turnovers. You know, If you do points off of turnovers on offense compared to defense and what they've had scored against them, 94-10, to 10, Notre Dame has outscored the competition in, as far as points off of turnovers. What does NC State do good on offense? They don't throw picks. Their quarterback, Finley, hasn't thrown an interception all year. I love NC State in this spot. Top play of the week for me. Uh, at Above a touchdown, now the market's you know, come down to seven here in the last 24 hours. I bet a rogue number of plus eight, but I think NC State not only covers, but I would not be shocked if they pulled the outright upset. Well, shame on the schedule makers here because that game's at 3.30. TCU and Iowa State's oh at 3.30, although, you know, I mean, we, we probably didn't really know that Iowa State was going to be as good as they are. So, you know, a little bit of flex scheduling would have helped out here with that one. But how about this other game at 3.30? I don't know if people are talking about this one or not. We'll, we'll, have, to, uh, we'll have to see if, you know, people are paying attention to this game. But Ohio State hosts Penn State. And, and what's a moderately big game for both teams here? Ohio State, six-and-a-half-point favorite. There's a rogue six. There's a rogue seven. But most of the market at six-and-a-half now. Um, this number opened five in the offshore market at bookmakers, so it has gone up a little bit. Uh, I mean, is, is there any line value on this game? No, not really. But, I mean, I, I get it. It's the biggest game. I would say so far this college football season, I know Florida State, Alabama got a lot of pub early on, but we've seen Florida State tank since then. So, so to date, this is going to be the most important game. Uh, I'm leaning with the Buckeyes. I'll probably have a small bet on the Buckeyes. Just, uh, I mean, I'm not too far different than Joe Public. If it's a big game and I'm going to sit down and, and you know watch it a, a little bit, I, I wouldn't mind having a little bit of money. And I think they're the right side here, starting with you know their head coach, Urban Meyer, in my opinion, the best coach maybe in college football history when it comes to extra time to prep for a game. In his career, he's 47-4 and four straight up. And then for our purposes, more importantly, 36-12-1 against the number with extra rest. That is every single season opener, anytime he's off a bye week, any bowl game, 47-4 and four straight up, 36-12-1 against the number. And he hasn't lost straight up in the regular season since his very first season when Brad Powers was a freshman at uh, Bowling Green when he was coaching uh, my, my Falcons at that time. He lost to Miami, Ohio, who their quarterback at that time, I believe, was Ben Roethlisberger. So he's been absolutely money. Love the situational spot with them coming off a bye. Penn State coming off an A-plus effort against Michigan. And, and look, uh, you, you look at uh, you know, Ohio State's defensive line, I think it's finally playing up to its potential. Uh, and I think Saquon Barkley has shown, at least in a couple games this year, particularly Northwestern, he can be shut down. And I don't trust Trace McSorley to be able to beat the Buckeyes. Buckeyes with revenge as well. Add it all up. Give me the Buckeyes minus the points. I, I think they make a national statement here that they're second best team in the country outside of Alabama. Uh, I, I certainly hope so. That's the outcome that I'm looking for here on Saturday. And uh, that'll be one where I probably pound a 12 pack, not even a six pack, but probably a 12 pack before, while that game's going on. And of course, Hey, three thirty start. You can start early in the day. So that's good. All right. Let's flip over to the NFL side here for a few minutes. Talk about a couple of these games. And, and I want to touch on the bears and saints game here. Saints laying nine down in the Superdome. The Bears' defense has been pretty damn good this year. They've got a couple of wins here with Mitch Trubisky as the starting quarterback, but Trubisky really hasn't factored into the equation a whole lot. I think he's got 12 completions over the last two weeks. Uh, so, I mean, this is one of those games where you, you figure Drew Brees is going to get his. Is this a litmus test for this Bears' defense? 
Yeah, I think it is. Uh, they've kind of, you know, faked it a little bit, particularly last week. I mean, when they got out first down 20 to five and, and went a game 17 to three, they get a 75 yard fumble return, a 76 yard interception return by Eddie Jackson in that one. Uh, I mean, <laughs> not sure you can count on that one two weeks in a row. You're right, Trubisky, they're not even attempting to pass, although there's been some creative play calling with him as they're protecting him. But, man, I, I'll tell you, talk defense. I think the Saints defense has exceeded expectations so far this season. Uh, and it's a team that's red hot after their 0-2 start, have won and covered four straight games. They at least get the job done against a backup quarterback last week up in Lambeau. Uh, boy, I'm not in the business usually of laying nine points here, uh, particularly with New Orleans, at least their pass of not being very good on the defensive side of the ball. But th- that's where the lean is for me. I'll take the Saints minus the points, and I might even sneak a little bit more of some under, uh, another under pick uh, as far as I'm concerned there because, you know, I thought New Orleans a couple weeks ago had, you know, obviously scored three defensive touchdowns to make that beyond a huge out, uh, high-scoring game against the Lions. So I'll probably sneak a little bit New Orleans and, and the under in this one, but neither one is one of my favorite plays of the week. All right, let's move on to game 265-266 here. The Chargers take on the New England Patriots, and the Patriots took care of business last week against the Falcons. It was an interesting game with all that fog settling in. Sunday night game, Super Bowl revenge. Lots of stuff going on with that one. Now they host the Chargers. They're laying anywhere from 7 to 8.5 in the market, depending on where you look. There's a lot of 7.5s out there as well. And you know what the narrative is going to be about the Patriots here. People started doubting the Patriots. You don't doubt Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. They show it again here in a primetime spot against the Falcons. Now, looking at this one, it's pretty interesting. I was actually talking about this game with my boss in terms of the Super Contest. The Chargers, back on October 8th, were a three-point dog with cross-country travel and an early kick against the New York Giants. Now they're only a a seven-and-a-half-point dog against New England, and there are some sevens out there as well. Something doesn't feel like it adds up here. Yeah, uh, look, I'm not running to the window to bet against uh, the Chargers, uh, but I did last week with, uh, uh, you know, I bet against the Chargers uh, in that game against Denver and got my teeth kicked down my throat here. Uh, I will say early on I predicted, and this is one advantage, and I'm going to do a little cross promotion here as far as my Sunday night owl newsletter, first one that gets sent out out of any newsletter in the marketplace. I gave out New England prior to the Sunday night game being played because I thought they would be the right side here. It was five and a half, at least at the look ahead numbers and offshore at that particular time. Because I thought, you know, the public, if they lose to Atlanta and the money was against them in that particular game, then the market's definitely going to want to play on Belichick and Brady off a straight up loss at home. And if they looked impressive, I thought the public would also want to play on them because they just lost going up against them. And if they looked impressive, which they did, they'd want to bet them. So I didn't see any other way other than that line moving up. And, of course, they crossed right through a key seven number. So Sunday night, I'll update. Uh, that, that is a key newsletter there if you want to get ahead of, of line movement. Uh, the Chargers obviously have impressed. They, they've been road warriors. Uh, they hadn't looked good at home prior to last week, but they find a way to shut out the Broncos, one of my top plays of the week. Uh, first time Denver gets shut out and since 92. Man, that was a bad look. I'm still not over that. I, I think they're probably a little, still a little bit overvalued in the marketplace. I, I mean, Oakland missed an extra point, and they beat a lowly Giants team. I, I think the buy sign's on for New England. Uh, I think they're figuring things out on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I think, obviously, the wide receivers, and, and keep in mind he had a couple of new faces in there uh, in th- this year. I think they're starting to click. Even at I should never recommend this right through a key number and playing, you know, after a line move like that. But I still think New England's the right side here. I'd lay it with the Pats. Is there anything else you really like in the NFL this week? You know what I do? I, I like a couple of, of short dogs uh, on the road. I actually, I think Oakland that game uh, last week uh, could have been a season saver for them scoring on the last play. I actually think without Lynch could be actually a positive because he's been more of a distraction than, than, you know, being really productive this season. So I lean with uh, the Raiders there. Uh, A game I really like, I like Carolina uh, plus the points. And I also, you know, my favorite play as far as totals this week, I like the over in the Carolina-Tampa Bay game. I think you get a shootout there, particularly the fact that, you know, Cam Newton has been off and on. Well, last week he was off. I think this could be a week where he's on. And 
I got to be impressed with uh, what Winston, his shoulder looked fine last week. He throws for nearly 400 yards, uh, and that was a little bit of a misleading game. So I, uh, I think Carolina and Tampa Bay light up the scoreboard. I'll take over in the Carolina Tampa Bay game. Brad Powers from BradPowersSports.com. What's going on over at the website right now, man? Yeah, we talk about it each and every week. I, I threw in an extra newsletter there about the Sunday Night Owl report. But if you want a game write up on every single college game, every single NFL game, top picks of the week, computer projected lines, straight up records, ATS records, power ratings, bad beats, misleading finals, major injuries, you name it, we got it. It's called the Powers Picks Newsletter, and I'm going to do a bang the book special here after the show. Forty-nine bucks will cost, and that is not for the week, not for the month, but for the rest of the season, all the way through the Super Bowl. You get an email to you each and every Wednesday around noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Forty-nine bucks for bang the book customers. Go to BradPowerSports.com after the show. Here we'll get that updated price up there for you guys. And you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers and the number seven. Brad, BradPowerSports.com. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next week, brother. Sounds good. Take care, my friend.